today we're looking at S. Peterson, that's Sandy Peterson's Field Guide to Lovecraftian Horrors. It's written by Sandy Peterson, Lynn Willis, and Mike Mason, illustrated by Loic Muzi. Oh, I can't pronounce those, I'm sorry. I'm British, we don't learn other languages. Call of Cthulhu, 7th edition, horror role playing in the world of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, it was written in 2015, or published, should I say, in 2015, written before that. Um, and, well, and there's not much more to say, is that here's a, here's a table of contents. There's a foreword, there's Monsters of the Mythos. I like this bit, we'll get to this in a minute. Identifying Monsters of the Mythos, that's handy. So then there's various uh, monsters. Then we've got a second section, Creatures of the Dreamlands, separate from Monsters of the Mythos. Uh, there's a forward in there and various creatures there. At the end, we've got morphology of mythos monsters and recommended reading. It says here, in what is supposed to look like handwriting, a field of, it'll just be a computer font, a field observer's handbook of preternatural entities and those beings from the land beyond the wall of sleep. To Robert Block, these nightmares return and Gayan Wilson with admiration. Let's get cracking then. Look at that. It's an interesting being to begin with. Here's the foreword. I won't read it all out, but it's there. By the way, it's quite a nice book. This it's sort of, as you can probably tell, maybe not. I'll tell you, it's about A4 size, or maybe slightly smaller. I'm not sure, but it's nice and, and sort of handy sized. There's another beast. So we're in the Monsters of the Mythos section, first of all. And look at that. That's pretty ooh, horrific. Those gaping teeth. Um, so yeah, still an introduction. Here we go. This is where the, the fun starts. Ident identifying monsters of the mythos. So you start with one, and for some reason it's there, not sort of in the corner, but fair enough. There, there we go. So the first question is for the monster, is it invisible? If yes, go to question two. If no, go to question three. So it splits off automatically. Uh, and then, you know, if it was, for example, um, if it was invisible, then you go to question two. Is the noise it emits a weird piping or whistling? Well, if so, then you're talking about the flying polyp on page 28. So you can go straight there. Um, so if you're sort of, if you there, you know, observing a strange creature, you don't know what it is, follow the questioning and you'll soon be able to locate what it is and find out more about it. That's the idea anyway. But let's move on anyway. The Azathoth. What is this? It's the seething nuclear chaos. Yeah, it does look pretty seething and nuclear. Right, so we've got a, a bayaki. It's like a flying thing with a weird, weird legs. Though biologically unrelated, structurally the bayaki's loon is found where stingers are located in earthly bees. Might the loon originally have had an attack function? Don't know. Extensive data on the Bayaki is found in Trier, 1984. And what I like about each of these beasts is um, you get like a comparative height chart for them, so you get to see how big it is compared to a normal human being. And in this case, the human being is running away. Rightly so. I would probably be doing the same. So that's that. So moving on to the Chthonian. Comparative height chart. This thing is immense. It's like a it's like a big sort of leech thing. I don't know. There's an emerging hatchling here. But it's scary how big that is like. Whoa. Dark young. Again, quite sizable on the comparative height chart. Figure four, a dark young attacks. What does it do? It spreads its legs and then sort of uh, what like pokes with these pokey bits. These bits, stings. Oh, there's loads of information about each of these. Habitat tells you where they kind of hang out, where to find them. Deep one. They hopped irregularly, sometimes on two legs and sometimes on four. Their croaking, baying voices held all the dark shades of expression which their st staring faces lacked. Mm. And this thing, just, just bigger than a man or woman. Mode of travel, just up out of the water, look, onto the feet, and off we go. Looks like they're as happy swimming as they are on the land. 
progressive degeneration caused by the deep one genetic taint. At age 34, the human is nearly ready for the change. The skin, peels and the ears have been resorbed. Soon the nose will drop off. That's horrible. Yeah. So they change around the age of 34 from a, what looks like a normal human being into uh, one of these what deep ones via the four stages of degeneration. I sometimes feel like I'm going through various stages of degeneration in life. Right, the doll, the doll. I don't know if you pronounce it like that. This, again, is immense. And does it live in the sand? Habitat deep underground. It's a bit like something from Tremors. The doll never frequents the surface of a world until it has riddled and ruined the interior of the crust. A riddled crust, sounds like something from Pizza Hut, this, is like a sponge with the whole tunnels extending in every direction. An electro terrifying... A terrifying labyrinth, it says. Dull mouth, mouth parts. I can't seem to talk today. I'm sorry about that. I keep getting the, the sounds wrong. So here's the dull mouth parts. These mouth parts are normally kept retracted with the forebody. They can be quickly extended when needed. I bet they can. There's the mouth open there and mouth completely closed. Look at this. It's ripped up through the ground, sending that tree and bit of rock flying, nearly hitting this barn. Close. Right, we've got a dimensional shambler. That's how tall they are. They live between dimensions, obviously, if they shamble between dimensions. The, the dimensional shambler continually traverses the plains, emerging to feed or, in, or engage in rituals, then returning to its not native non-continuum. Oh, it's all very technical, but um, they seem very nebular, these things. Four poor articulation. Um, fingers on each of the hand structure are reversed to serve as thumbs. Right. Very low hands scraping the floor. I might have nightmares tonight after looking through this. Probably will. Right, now we've got an elder thing. This is not a young thing, it's an elder thing. Um, what is it? An, or an old one, they're often called. It's a crinoid like half vegetable organism with a star shaped head. Yeah, it looks like something from Alien or something. It's probably opened up and those things have come out. I don't know. So it lives in the deep sea. That's also terrifying. I'm never going in the sea again. I know these are make-believe, but my mind will believe they're there. These creatures inhabited a wide variety of terrains. Conceivably, one might be found anywhere. That's really worrying. And a pretty big vertical adjustment. An elder thing can alter its height by extending its neck and or stalk. When extended, the neck reveals a set of gill slits. Does it now? Uh, anyway, there's more information there. Let's move on. And we've got a flying polyp. We, we heard about this earlier, didn't we? The flying polyp. So these were invisible, I believe. Um, it says they were only partly material and had the power of aerial motion despite the absence of wings. How? How, I ask? There were suggestions of a monstrous plasticity and of temporary lapses of visibility. Right. Well, it's, what, a, what a mysterious creature this is. It can fly without wings. It can become, what, invisible, perhaps, at will? Um, but it looks like it can also walk on its oh, eight limbs. So ground movement, the polyp extrudes five toed limbs to support itself or to move without flying. Although it can fly, this creature often strolls considerable distances on the ground. Or I imagine it's disgusting. Got the formless spawn. Look at that. It's, yeah, it looks like it's just full of a load of eggs or something. Um, not as big as some of the others, which is a relief probably run away from that thing or even jump over it um, so they found living uh, they found living things that worshipped onyx and basalt oh dear Im images of the Sathogua. I'm gonna just stop trying to read that this has nine stages of forward movement oh no figure nine stages of forward movement sorry I'm really not reading this it tells you how it moves apparently Appendages on the being's upper surface pull it forward as it moves. Fresh appendages sprout from behind. The diagram does not convey the thing's speed over 20 miles an hour for extended distances. Can you believe it? Well, there was me saying, you know, this is not too frightening when you could jump over it. It can shift this thing. And it can go for extended distances. Right, fungi from Yugoth. Or fungi from Yugoth. I don't know. Crustaceous bodies. 
bearing pa vast pairs of dorsal fins or membranous wings and several sets of articulate limbs. Do you know what? It's hard to read this book. I don't know if it's just me. It seems just to have a lot of tricky words all kind of lined up together in sentences. And with a sort of convoluted ellipsoid covered with multitudes of very short antennae where a head would not ordinarily be. According to H.P. Lovecraft himself, there it is. It's bigger than a person. It can do this. What's up here? Fungi technology, the ultimate purpose of this cylinder is unclear. It contained a hu living human brain when discovered in Northern Canada. Note the three plugins around the centre gill. Huh? So this is a brain storage. I don't know what any of that is. I'm trying to understand. Oh my God, a ghast. Look at that. Run for the hills. It's a ghast. It's ghastly, this ghast. To humanise the most repulsive underground life form. Yes. What's that film uh, where they go underground? Cave in. I can't remember now. It looks like one of the things from there. Hmm. Anyway, I've talked quite a bit. I'm going to just keep flicking through the pages to show you the rest of them um, without my uh, incessant waffle. So here we go. <laughs> kind of burgundy ribbon this book not all books have this do they I suppose it's quite makes sense for a field guide you might be looking at one of these that you saw whilst you're out having a little sort of hike or swim you might want to just say that's where I am so there's the ribbon interesting book it's very niche probably and I have to apologize that I've probably got a lot of this wrong the pronunciations and some other facts perhaps or interpretations of what's in here but there we go it's probably makes perfect sense to those who are you know HP Lovecraft fans of fanatics um, it's a nice book it's, it's, it's a nice book to look at it's well made um, and you know even for someone who isn't really au fait with this kind of lore, should we say. Um, it's definitely interesting to read and uh, to look at. It's quite inspiring. Uh, I like some of the illustrations. Um, so yeah, not bad.